All right, I take it by uh, the turnout that you guys sensibly, uh, well, everybody else sensibly figured out that, you know, I don't really have anything specific prepared here. Uh, uh, but I'm glad there's a very small number of people here. So I will, I will literally try anything here. I, I, I have nothing, I don't know what I'm going to do. So you, you guys have to be like the primary drivers of content here. But uh, this, I think the smart thing to do, though, would be to not like, like, try to get me thinking real hard. <laughs> like, if you were like, unless you enjoy watching a guy like try to think his way out of it like a non-compiling program for a while, just think like some guy who knew Scala really, 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 really well, but wasn't otherwise very bright. Like, but <laughs> put, put, him to, put him to work, like see what he could do, because that's, that's approximately the guy that's present. Um, yeah, I, so I have it all set up for uh, Scala 2.10, so don't throw like 2.11 things in there. But um, it might be entertaining like, or even educational to like, if you want to see like, how some features might be used together or just how you can crash the compiler. Yeah, the print is of value classes would be one project. Oh, yeah, the fringes of value classes. I, I can't keep straight in my head what's only working in my, my pattern matcher repository and what's in the real thing. Yeah, well, shoot, I, I don't have that thing built, though. I think I better try to stick to mainstream. No, 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 I meant like the general. Yeah, the general, right. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of fringe for me. I like to, <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to start this thing, and then I'm just going to sit down, and uh, we can just sit here quietly for an hour if you want, but I'll, I'll assume we'll do something better than that. So I have a suggestion. What's that? So I'm really curious about combining interpreted Scala with compiled Scala, and the reason I ask is because when I use uh, Play Framework, I'm often stymied by compilation times. Um, well, there is no interpreted Scala unless you have an interpreter I don't know about. Um, there's only a REPL that pretends to be an interpreter and is actually compiling the code and then running it. Okay. Um, it's, it's the very poor man's interpreter. <laughs> Now, an interpreter is an interesting thing that has been discussed and continues to be discussed because it would change the uh, situation for macros if you could walk an AST and actually like run it a little bit. Uh, but at, that's at best plausible for a subset of Scala. Okay. Um, and it, I think it would be quite a project even then. There's a related question to compile times and play and the clips. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Uh, let's, get, uh, let's get ready. I'm using, I'm using Eclipse. I'm used to it. So uh, it's compiling reasonably well uh, incrementally on the play. And then when, pl when I save the file, play has to redo it. There's got to be a way that, that they could be uh, deduplicated. That work would be done twice. Well, so yeah, we're, we're working on, on that. Actually, so what you're seeing is bugs. And the compiler. Uh, play is especially sensitive to that because they do code generation for the wrong files mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and so Greg has for two of them have a compiler that we're, we, we're specifically optimizing for play. Um, right, no, that, that uh, would be like one test case. play so one incrementally I guess, of torturing. Right, play incrementally compiled by itself, I understand. I'm curious if the uh, two things couldn't be combined. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was uh, distracted by the blah, blah, blah on the screen. What, <laughs> Eclipse and the uh, what? And the Eclipse and Play both compile. Oh, so you, you're saying, sh why can't they share cross yes. files? They can. Um, it's, uh, well, Play would have to do the generating some code, and then Eclipse would compile the code in here. <laughs> yeah, let's model. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can figure out something. Um, yeah, I think in general you can share class files. But it depends. I mean, since I, it, I don't know the mechanics behind it. Are there any other situations? Well, if it doesn't generate. <laughs> files, it's all right, let's come back to um, incremental com compilers. <laughs> um, uh, there mu there's a bunch of Scala features nobody ever uses. Uh, it's, but maybe you've heard of them. Maybe you could, uh, if you've heard of something and never seen a cause for it or never seen like it used in a way that seems plausibly useful, maybe you could say it and I could, if it in fact has a plausible use, which it may not, uh, I, can, I can put that to work.
go for like the fringes here if you can, because it's like this is your like I, I've thought about nothing else for such a long time that it's you know squeeze something out of me. We could all be surprised together. Something with macros. So the problem with macros is just that it is a bit laborious because of the uh, you can't have the compile the macro and use the macro in the same compilation run. So uh, I have some like stuff set up for the like because you need basically two SBT projects: the one with the macros and then the one you depend on that uses the macros. And if I had all that stuff in place, then maybe I could. If I was ready for a macro thing. It would be good, but I, I'm sure you guys don't want to watch me going like, ah, stupid SPT. For no, you know, I mean, that's as fun as that is for me. I <laughs> probably doesn't generalize. So I think it'd be better to stick to mainstream language. Like ideally, something that is not particularly like, not something that involves like using a thing that isn't Scala, but something that involves like putting Scala itself to work in a way that only sucks on its built-in capabilities. All right, now we're talking. Now we're talking. OK, so path dependent types. So, yeah, so we've got something like, you know, stuff. And inside of that, we have, you know, you have feeding animals, right? But let's do something better than feeding animals. I don't know. Um, feeding dinosaurs. <laughs> um, what, do we, what do we care about around here? Um, Hmm? My stuff? My stuff? Is, is my stuff a, a... All right. All right. Well, let's just say type universe, value universe. And let's give universe some stuff in it, like, I don't know, uh, planet, <laughs> alien. All right, and then, and then we're going to import everything that's in the universe. And then we're going to write a method that takes an alien and a planet. <laughs> and I don't know, populates the planet. And I'm going to go give planet like a populate method. <laughs> Seems plausible. What's going on over there? Not found by alien. <laughs> Gotta, gotta keep those shortcuts going. All right, parameter type and structural refinement may not refer to an abstract type to find outside that refinement. Who's seen that message before? <laughs> yeah, it's a sad state of affairs. It's not even a particularly effective restriction. Um, so, yeah, that's right. So I'm gonna make that like trait planet instead of trying to be all abstract. And then, uh, Oh, and then I guess I'll make a trait universe. <laughs> Can I still have type alien, please? Yes, OK. All right, so clearly, universe, universe is just a, very, a specialization, something you find inside of stuff. <laughs> that is probably, maybe not that bad a model. <laughs> All right. And Can you just explain for one second what the difference like, how that weird message led you to decide to do it this way? Oh, so basically, when, you have at, when you're using abstract types um, and trying to write methods in particular, uh, the compiler gets upset if it cannot pin that abstract type down to something concrete enough in order to actually generate the method. Because this is where it's kind of the, its feet have been put to the fire. Uh, it has to actually generate something into the bytecode, and the JVM is quite unforgiving of any amount of flexibility here. Um, but uh, 
if as abstractly as I have defined things, it has no inkling whatsoever what that thing is. Um, in particular, reaching for like an abstract thing that is defined outside of where you are means it can't rely on being able to know what that is at the time that it's actually called. So it says get lost. So by moving everything into, because well, I said basically universe was anything, like arbitrary thing, and that it would just have these things defined inside it somehow. But now I've made universe an actual trait, which makes it concrete. There's a real thing, you know, there's a trait called stuff dollar universe now, um, and it's now no longer gonna be sweating that so much. Um, the exact circumstances of when this arises are a little fuzzy, but that's the gist. Uh, so we can have two different stuff places, each with their own universe. Object, my stuff, extend stuff. And for this to be interesting, I guess um, we need to take advantage of F from the concrete one. Um, oh yeah, so U is the guy we need here. Um, let's see how that goes. What, that compiles already? I feel like that was too, too easy. <laughs> well, it does compile already. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what's really going to, uh, uh, I'm trying to think. Because uh, when you start, the, the trick with path-dependent types is that it's generally unwise to use them in non-trivial ways. Um, <laughs> and so, it's like the things that like, because my, my performance, the, you can't turn off the stupid performance engines all the time. So there's all these parts of Scala that like are kind of neat in theory and that I just kind of turn them off. Because for instance, like let's, you know, there's a very appealing programming model, very, very, very appealing, um, where like let's say I was writing a compiler. Well, I would like to write it like the very top level, a very, a very abstract model of it, all right? And so like, you know, very, you know, here's the thing, you give me like a, like there's gonna be a type that's a source file and I'll be completely non-specific about it, right? And then there's gonna be some kind of compilation product that's like bytecode in our sort of standard case. And then there's gonna be something that just says compile and takes its source file and turns out as, I don't know, a set of compilation products. And then you could take, you know, you can take this quite a distance, you can refine you start with something very abstract like that, pinning down only like, you know, and ideally you do this with your concrete models in mind, you know, going back to my earlier talk so that you don't like make a bunch of pointless, painful abstractions for yourself. Um, but, you know, you're thinking about .NET and the JVM and who knows, whatever your like greatest abstract ambition is. And you define it there and then you go down a series of steps and you refine it. This is great, it works. It is also imposes a terrible penalty on you if you have any kind of implementation anywhere before the end. Um, I, was, I was showing Adrian yesterday what happens when uh, like the, the exact same code written in terms of scala.reflect.api versus scala.reflect.internal, uh, a method is 15 bytes in internal and 71 bytes in API. They look exactly the same to you. But the difference is that the types you're working with in API are abstract, and so when you do this pattern match, it doesn't get to go instance of at bytecode level. It has to say, okay, here comes the machinery. And so it whips up this whole implicit materialization business. In comes the type tag with the unapply that it can call at runtime to find out if that abstract type is matched by the actual thing that showed up. And it, does, it doesn't have the luxury that internal does of knowing that it's going to be an instance of foo.bar.baz. So that stuff really adds up. As like it's at one point, after they did the sort of partitioning into reflect and compiler, they uh, we had like a 40% slowdown in the compiler. Everybody's like, ah, oh, running around with their heads cut off. And I mean, like it, that was basically it, right? I mean, that, that turned that was definitely the problem. So anyway, uh, these you know, I really like abs you know this what I'm doing right here, this abstract type business, and especially I like, and this also this is this is brutally pessimized right here. You know, you like, you know, put a method in here, work it in terms of its, you know, even its own things. Because this is essentially saying, uh, this will be some unknown thing that has these methods, but I'm not even going to give you, like, any kind of concrete thing to hang your hat on at all. So it ends, that's going to be invoked via reflection, um, unless you're lucky, right? But if, you, if we try to write anything that uses any of this at this level, it's just going to be bad news. In fact, we should look at that. Let's do that. How come you could create a universe? Didn't you have that abstract type there? 
So that's a good question. Turns out that uh, Scala, for reasons I am probably shouldn't speculate on, um, I mean, I sort of know, and then I also, but anyway. Abstract types are not treated the way that abstract methods are. Like, you, you, your intuition is, you never implemented the abstract type, compilation failure. That's not how it's done. Instead, it just makes it any. Um, there, again, there's a plausible sort of implementation-driven reason for that. Um, I do not think there is a good like, language semantics reason for that. Uh, and I don't think the plausible reason is a good reason either. I, don't, I think it should just be an error, but it isn't. What do you think, Adrian? Yes, he says. That means I agree th uh, with Paul, yeah. is generally what that means. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't always like that. I'm trying to think back when it was changed. It was a long time ago. I mean, it's been doing that since at least, well, since I had showed up, so five years plus. And you're right, and that's, I, at some point I researched it, and uh, the re the, right, it, there was a reason, and it, it was something to do with like separate compilation or blah, 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 right? I mean, b basically it was like, it was too hard. Like, it was an implementation problem. Um, I don't think it was a good theoretical reason. Um, well, I mean, if you're, if you're being performance sensitive, not much. But uh, if you're not, then they're, they're fantastic for just modeling things at like the layer you want to expose. In an ideal universe, you'd use them much the same way you use abstract methods, which is to say you, you have an implementation with a bunch of stuff in it, but that's not what you want to expose. You want to expose a like idealized lesser version of that. The types of things are not like the concrete classes. You make all those private. Uh, and abstract types, like you can give people nice like solid traits and stuff as their thing, but if, you, if performance were a non-consideration, you'd much rather use abstract types because that gives them complete freedom of implementation. Like, in other words, like, like the abstract type that could, might turn out to be string or something, right? Something that they have no ability to modify. But if it's designed such that a type like that actually meets the test, then it's good enough. But implementation issues arise, right? I mean, like if you write methods in terms of an abstract thing and then it turns out to be string, then it has to do it via reflection. There's no real option there because it couldn't, you know, issue the actual bytecode that you needed to call it directly in string. Although that's not completely true. You can, there's other ways of like spinning stuff up and, but point is it's not easy for it and so you will pay. Um, but I mean, if, let's, let's say like take something like a tree, right? Uh, now we get this kind of thing all the time. You've got a leaf. You got a node, right? And then now you can write some methods that operate on leaves and nodes and do all the beautiful tree things that we all know and love. And we've said nothing about what leaf and node are. And they could be anything. And this is completely reusable, like generic in the truest sense code. This is the ideal. It's just that you pay for it. To give you type parameters, you don't have to specify when you're writing the type. So, I mean, since list is list of key, you always have to write list of some type. Yes, that's right. So type parameters um, are e just enormous pain in the ass because, like, if you change your type parameter situation, every call site must be touched. It's a that is a debacle. Um, if you want to add a type or something, you have this like combinatorial explosion of madness when you have like this thing with type parameters extends that thing with type parameters. It's terrible. Abstract types, in principle, do, can do everything that type parameters do, but without these big problems. But that is very much in principle. They are like, you know, they're just not up, they, they are not equal. They, they are second class citizens uh, in terms of their robustness and just like general usage. And that's too bad because in the ideal sort of unified, there would not be both type parameters and type members. Um, type members, type parameters would be just a special case of type members. That's like the idea for some future version of Scala, that it would desugar, like you'd write a you know, list, takes a T, and it would desugar that to like private this type member T, right? And then when you instantiate it, when you write new list of int, then it would desugar that to new list uh, type T equals int, and you're done. And then there's other neat things that come out of that, like you don't have to specify the types, like, you know, because 
There could be just whatever. It's got some bounds going on at, at a certain point. And now you just say, give me a list or, you know, give me a map. I haven't even told you what the key and the value are, but it's, it's learned from whatever context as much as it no, and now it's just going to like settle the bounds and give you, you know, it's a foo and a bar because that's what I know at this point. Or you could be more specific by giving the type parameters. Point is you'd be able to write map, not like map bracket, underscore, comma, underscore. Like, I never want to type, like, class of again, because I got to go class of, foo, underscore, underscore. What? You're just going to throw it away. Don't, I mean, give me some syntax, man. Just let me say the type constructor without the stupid, you know, meaningless applied underscores. These little things, you know, become a big things after the billionth time, personally. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, that's the advantage of abstract types. And then, you can, so here's like the refined version, right? It's like, say, and then like maybe file system tree or something, right? and, and then we can remain very abstract, but maybe like throw some new capabilities in here. Oops, look at that, I'm, I'm so abstract, I'm doing that. Like in principle, that would be a good syntax. Uh, in fact, that, that leaked in by accident at some point um, from some change I made, because yeah, anyway, Miles was like, is that the new syntax? That's great, uh-oh, so I had to pull it. Um, so yeah, here. So maybe you have like a val root, you know, which is a which is a node. Um, anyway, uh, point being that like you can remain abstract, start bringing in your your buddies the values, and they can be abstract in terms of what it is that they are, and you defer everything to the guy at the end. It's make it a his problem. Um, but you you write in terms of the abstractions that make sense at your level, and the one of the like most. The, Productivity killers I see all the time is the inability to like keep your levels straight. So you have you know like stuff that's like pure logic operating on a, in sort of a pure domain of logic, and it's just interspersed mad with these mad compiler details of you know like this flag and that crazy bit and all this extremely implementation specific stuff. And this is death. Uh, there's, you should be as pure as you, for any given thing, as pure as you can be, be that pure, and then access it from the crazy implementation stuff. Um, so you, but you must be like, you know, adept at building these layers and composing and not composing this stuff. So yeah, I see this is just turning into me like ranting about programming rather than. <laughs> so, I, so I hope that's not too disappointing. But I, 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 you'll get more information out of me by me just ranting than me like you know trying to type. No, I'm totally willing. But anyway, uh, are there other questions I can answer with you know, Paul's crazy opinions about programming? <laughs> I'll check my book. I don't know if it's any cool. Oh, well, I can show you one, one trick I like because nobody ever realizes that it can be done without laziness. <laughs> Let's see, val x stream int equals can't decide. I can't remember even what the operators on stream are. I never use stream. Stream's not really my thing. It's like, it's like the, no, it's got to be that, right? All right, and then some reference to x here will do it. Well, wait, let's just see what that does. Yeah, um, so that should be an infinite stream of ones, I guess. Uh, it's not the Fibonacci I was going for, which will need a little like some throw another one in there, or like I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, point is though, the fact that that didn't already like go bad is makes the point, which is to say uh, you can make an infinite sequence that's like self-referential that actually works without laziness, which is surprising in, in like, because if you try that in other circumstances, that's going to be a big fat null. But let's see here, x take 10 to this. <laughs> no, it's always been like that. It's, uh, it's like you, you're sort of, your internal model about how things work causes you to expect that like NPE there. Um, and well, let's see, I mean, like if it's, Right. Uh, if it isn't stream, you do get it. But the thing is that because this is called by name, right, the creation of the cell in stream is called by name, then by the time it gets around to actually going for x, it's there. <laughs> right? Whereas with list, it's not. Um, so yeah, I don't know how cool that is. So when I do stuff that's infinite, I tend to use uh, iterator, not stream, because iterator has the wonderful property of actually forgetting things, which is usually what you want, or usually what I want. Um, you know, if I'm like going for the eight billionth element of some infinite stream, I don't really want to be pulling the other 7.99 billion elements behind me. Mostly I want to just get there and get the one. 
because I don't have that much memory. Um, what would, what would it represent a cool thing? I mean, it's possible I can do cool things and I might be setting the bar for cool too high. <laughs> um, like, let's see. So I'll give you some like iterator stuff that's fun. I mean, so there's, a, there's a, this function continually, right? So like, you know, that's an infinite series of ones. Although we could do something like util.random.nextint, and that would be a little more exciting. So if we do that and then take 50 and then show them, then we have. So <clears throat> that's a really quick and easy way to fire up like a whole bunch of something. Um, and take, I just took 50, but there were plenty more. <laughs> that went on indefinitely. Um, you know, or some. I just added 50 random numbers. That's a powerful, useful thing right there. <laughs> Maybe I got a non-random number out by adding 50. You don't know. <laughs> nah, it looks random. <laughs> um, let's see. What else can we do with uh, that? Well, I mean, I don't know. Does zipped work on pairs of iterators? I don't know. Let's just like to stream it. Right. So now I've got like pairs of random numbers going for whatever that's worth. I, I, you know, I don't know that we're getting any cooler here. Now I'm adding two random numbers in a pairwise and then, now, and then summing that. And clearly we're in totally new territory here as we just keep <laughs> overflowing uh, the int. <laughs> um, let's see. Here's, uh, like, here's something I do from time to time. Right. So there's a handy way to get like your one bit guy in each spot. Oh, I know. Let me do something good with value classes. Um, so value classes are super useful. Here's something I would love to introduce to the standard library, which I don't know if I get to use. Do. OK. So we're going to give it a private constructor. It's called index. I bet you can guess what it is. It's an int. But it is much better than an int because I'm going to, first of all, guarantee by construction that it's always non-negative. If x is less than 0, throw an exception the easy way, else new index x. Oh, I forgot to val it. Um, but it's an int. You don't pay any cost. Watch. So here's like def f. You know, you've got a list of something, and you want to know the index of something. This will be index of, in fact. Index of. Index of whatever. T. Looking for some particular T. I index equals index. And then I'll use the real index of. But the point of this one is to look at the bytecode of that. See that? Second, second thing in that? Public int. You get to return an int. That's just like the real index of does. But it's better. <laughs> Much better. Uh, you know, the, many, the, 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 the cavalier usage of int for just whatever comes along, it's madness. It is only from like, being hypnotized by earlier generations that we allow this. In a language with types, it is nuts that like any given thing you think of for a number, oh, let's just throw that in the same type. It's our catch-all number-like things. So my meters might be inches, might be number of planets in some other solar system. They're all ints. That's crazy. We have types. There's no way you should be able to mix these things up. So index is just like should be the first of a long line of things where you see any, basically, if you return int in the API, why don't you just return any and give it up? Just say, like, here comes a thing. <laughs> Eat it. Figure out what it is, right? And at least with a thing, you can like type match your way and find out, oh, well, it's a this or it's a that. You can't distinguish ints. They're all the same. Of course, that's also true of the value classes, but the point is not to distinguish them after the fact. The point is to retain the static type of what they are so that you never lose sight of what they are, and then it's not a problem. And you pay no penalty for that now, and so the, the argument against it is gone. It just becomes like, I like bugs uh, at this point. <laughs> Where do you 
do the exception here? Where do you do the check? Well, uh, the creation of, uh, there's an extension method call in here to into something, right? Yeah. It's, this is the constructor oh, yeah. that, where I wrote that. So okay. notice it's int int. Again, we're not paying any price here. This is all about, you know, Hotspot's great at these like tiny int int methods. You don't need to sweat that, but we allocate nothing. So it's going to call this exception, otherwise non-negative. You can tell because I gave it a private constructor. The only thing that can touch that is the int companion object. And the int companion object, it's got a nice one-liner that you can verify for correctness. If it's less than zero, we're going to throw it. Um, and so this is just the beginning of like useful things. Now there's another uh, one that I have, and that is an interval. And so the wonderful thing about an interval is that you can have two ints and not box, because you're going to take your two ints and you're going to put them into a value class where the underlying thing is a long. And then you will, inside the value class, you will magically do the decomposition into the first thing and the second thing. But you will still have no boxing, because what's going to be returned at the bytecode level is a long. So that would look something like this. going to blow uh, any like bit manipulation here on the fly but um, and then in interval I would have methods like low and high which take it back out of the long so they say okay and and that's like a really like obvious use to take two instances to come in along but you can do much better so I'm doing range positions in the compiler and I need more than two I need like I need start I need like the offset to where the point is and then the end I need three uh, plus, I want to encode some other information, like whether it's a transparent position or not, but that's OK. So I've got, I'm going to go 20 bits, 20 bits, 20 bits, and then I've got four bits for signaling. Right? All of this, you package this all up into a nice, like, you know, it's low-level stuff, but you do it right, low-level stuff, where you can believe it, and let everybody else use the high-level thing, but they pay no price. It's all there, just, just primitives flying around. It's, it is really, it's money. Um, it's definitely the way to go. And so the, the real payoff, though, comes when you take this stuff and put it with the work I'm doing on the pattern matcher right now, which is turning that into an allocation-free experience in extractors. So at that point, you can take something like one of like index, for instance. Uh, you can write it something like that that's an extractor. You give it an is empty method for failure, and you give it, and so then you can just pick any inch you want that you want to be failure, let's say minus one. Uh, and then everything else that's up is success. Then you can return that as your extractor, and so you've got the whole semantics of pattern matching, but again, it's just an int. You pay no price. There's no, so it'll, com I, for me personally, it's completely changing the way I program already, which is why I'm so determined to get it into uh, Trunk, because the, the main killer on extractors is uh, performance. And it's legit. I tried at various points to make some changes in the compiler, and it was not tolerable. Um, but that argument's gone. And so you get this just tremendous flexibility for you know, what you want to expose and you can you basically you can take of any view you want of some piece of data and the cost of doing that is extremely low and you get these just you could your pattern representations of things tend to be far superior in terms of like believability than you know manipulating a bunch of text um, example of cool thing that I did uh, <coughs> A string, so I'm doing this work on class paths, and you've got like a string and th that's fed to you by like zip file or something. So it's a path, and there's a bunch of slashes in it, and I need to know like what all the substrings are, the individual path components. So I did that with no substrings. Instead, I have a thing that goes and like finds the indices at which those exist, and then packs them all into a value class along these lines, and then, and then uses that as the basis of a sequence where it pretends to be these things, but is actually just going to index into them as necessary and show you those cares. So you, there's no allocations, in other words. You're using the original string and a single 
int or long, depending on how ambitious you are to like allow for really long paths, but you can fit an awful lot of slashes into 32 bits, given that you know it's they're mostly coming like right after each other, right? So you only it's a very small amount. Uh, point being, it's you know the opportunities are are numerous. Like it's really shocking how much uh, CPU is wasted on basically just string processing. In our case, for sure. I think in most people's case. Um, so yeah, these are like neat opportunities. Uh, it's a series of offsets. So you've got a string, um, and you want to know where the slashes are, and so you ask. And it walks the string and says, OK, uh, f uh, on the fourth care, there was one. And then like five later, there's one. And so it gets all those and encodes them, you know, like whatever, however many bits it needs for that. Less than 32 is the case in, in, in practice. Um, and then the value class is happy to just turn back around. The value class has a method that says, if you give me the string that this applies to, then I'll tell you, I'll give you a sequence which has uh, those substrings as its elements, but it never allocates the substrings. It never has to. It knows where they are. So as you ask, then you get them. So right? you're saying the next slash would have to come within some small amount, like if well, yeah, we're talking about paths. We're talking about paths here, right? Right. 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 The, you're, you're limited by uh, right. I mean, six bits, and then it's going to be within a 64 as the next thing. You you can pick a bunch of different encodings here, and they're all going to run out of space if you have like a gigantic string. But fortunately, it's not an issue. Like no nobody's got a jar with like a 10,000 character path. Right. Um, so, <laughs> if, if, like if, frankly, I don't wish to support them in that. I'd like to actively undermine them. So, so. What did you use in practice, though? What, what did you find was like a good trade-off for the? Well, I found that 32 bits was more than like it never came up. In practice, it was never a problem to easily fit like the actual occurrence in 32 bits, but. If it was, I don't know. I don't know. I think about, I don't know. I think there's probably a few ways to compress it, but it's, uh, I'm not. Oh, I wasn't overly concerned with it because it's the it's the spirit of the solution that is right. like relevant in, in uh, well for me there and for me here. So yeah, and there are lots of these things. It's it, like anytime you're returning like option int somewhere, this is brutal. You box twice. Not just for option, but for int, because it's got to be go into an option which is not specialized. So you are returning a sum around an integer box around an int. Both the boxes fall away with the capability I just described in the pattern matcher. And so you just return what looks like option int, but it's like it's a value, imagine value class option, call it opt, you return opt int. And then, then at bytecode level, that's just int, where some particular int is it represents failure. <laughs> this is the future. So earlier in a different talk, you were you said kind of shy away from value. Yeah. So, uh -huh. so can you talk about what you should be using? Well, so all the basically anywhere where you you all, these are all like very sort of direct specialized uses. Um, if you let them sort of infiltrate your general purpose models, it's the problem is compositional and. These are implementation concerns. Like value classes, in, in in principle, like nothing should stop you. Value classes are pure optimization. It's all good. Um, there's, uh, but in practice, uh, there are a bunch of bugs at the intersection. Basically, if you're trying for too much generality, uh, so that's why you know these cases are like specific things that would benefit from being more typeful, but where we have historically not wanted to do that for performance reasons. There's another good one. Um, uh, like ordering, I mean, it's crazy. You, you, what is the like? If you look at you know comparable or whatever, what does that method return? That did, when you want to compare two things, what's like the the thing? What is the type of the that it returns? Int. You have, so you've taken there's four billion possible values, and you're asking a question that has three answers, and you have stuffed that into a four billion value space and act like it's normal. It's nuts. Like, it's crazy. So we don't have to do that. Well, we should never have had 4 billion, but now we can get down to 3, which is a lot better in every way. right? So you can have, um, basically, pick your values, minus 1, 0, and 1. That's it. That's all that can be created. And you return a value class type that wraps you know, maybe a byte, although it's hard to win like by shrinking in these spots because everything gets widened to an int. 
in JVM anyway. So I mean, maybe you're still in Int. I don't know if anybody's packing a lot of, like the only place you might win is storage, and I don't know who's storing a lot of like comparison results. So, but <laughs> but point being, like we can at least limit the size of the type. It's crazy. What else? What else? This is, this is what I should have done. It's like, just like, your programming question, because I do feel like I, I do nothing else but this. So I've had time really to think of a lot of stuff. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I have a problem, but you may as well benefit from it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, which will probably drive you up the wall. But in general, like, I had a uh, binary method, right? And I tried to have a value, which was you know, a function, basically the method was an underscore. And the binary method had a default argument value. And I was just wondering, why can't I call the function with just a single argument? Why does that require only like, two arguments that make sense? I'm going to say that did not make sense. I mean, maybe it did probably make sense in, in your mind, but not in a way that actually made it to me being able to parse it. Um, by, by binary method, you mean like two arguments, two arguments two where, where one of them is not this. We're talking about like just some method off in the universe yeah, maybe takes two things. Object, well, remember, you know, just and of one of them is a function, one of the arguments? No, no, no. no. Uh, so it has two, two parameters, and one of them has a default value. So okay. Okay. And then I say val f equals whatever the method name is underscore. Oh, okay. So you're talking in either way, but you know I, I can't obviously. And I'm just wondering, like, what would? What well, you're just you're. It's just implementation stuff. Yeah. So that trailing underscore. Martin's tried to kill that trailing underscore a number of times. Uh, it hasn't succeeded. I'm sort of glad, sort of not. Um, it's like because the trailing underscore is sort of a weird, like, buggy at edit expansion. Um, uh, and, yeah, so what it comes like, there's, I'm not even going to try to answer that question. It's the implementation. Um, when you start saying, like, well, there's default arguments, and uh, I'm doing edit expansion, and there's a value, it's, it's, at this point, it's the implementation. There's a million things that like, one could step back and say, well, you know, this ought to work. Forget it. Uh, it w as soon as you intersect two or three things written by three different people across six years in like hairy and hairier parts of the compiler, then forget it. It's just, it just doesn't work because it doesn't work. Default arguments in particular were a, a source of some real potential ambiguity, and they still have some super annoying aspects like you know, having to put the parens on to call anything that takes any default arguments, even if you have no arguments to pass. And this was because of ambiguity with like something. I forget. But uh, it's, yeah, it's a. But you can't overload a, you can't have default arguments on overload. That's, that's right, and in principle, there's like you could allow for like a sub like common cases where you would be allowed to overload and have default arguments. But again, it's basically like it's too complicated, and you know we just don't have like this giant stable of people going, give me a super complicated, ill-specified thing to handle. Um, so sometimes you know you just say discretion's a better part of valor and outlaw stuff. That's what happened there. Is, is it just because you come up with a name for the dot class file? Um, well, it's, it's because overloading resolution is ridiculously complicated already. And to have it to combine um, defaults, uh, where you, so that leaves you like even more in the dark about which methods are applicable in the first place, it's too much. Go look at the implementation sometime. You will quickly be disabused of any notions uh, like that it's a good idea to complicate this stuff. Um, yeah, it's just a bad scene there. It's like, it, it, and it's, it's inherently like the language spec. It's one of the most complicated things in the language spec. It's, it's and like it's famously cited. Is it 623.6 or something? It's like, it, it, it's, it comes up enough that like the number is, you know, and I still don't understand it. I, st I definitely do not understand it, but I don't understand most of the specs, so I'm not the guy to say that. Mark's, Mark, Cl Mark Hara claims to understand it. I, I don't know. He's like the only guy I've seen, like, I understand it, you know, just like willing to stand on that. But that's Mark. But you could kind of overload it by hand, right? Like, I mean, you could say, like, I have the three. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can essentially reproduce yeah. the, the, the. You just said it doesn't blow but, up. But you can't. I mean, you can and you can't. You can't get the kind of combinations the default arguments give you. Right, um, like try to take, make, give a method like eight default arguments, and now try to overload that by hand, and you will find yourself very so distressed. Right, you have two to the eight, eight to situations. Uh, I see, yeah. 
right? Whereas you can you get all those at once with defaults. But you can't exploit that power uh, when you're overloading. Um, I don't know because just because I don't have a completely clear view of what we're talking about here, and the tiniest details all matter. Um, but uh, it's the, the long and the short of it is that trailing underscore mechanism of turning a method into a value is uh, just going to have like sharp edges when it encounters things like default arguments. That's just the way it is. Yeah. I would note that because it's really handy. And I guess before I, bef since I no longer have the energy to like try to, because I've tried before to change the signature of stuff like index of and, uh, and compare. Back before we had value classes, I still thought it was more important to be correct than you know, performant. Now, but I, I don't have the energy to get this stuff in anymore. So it's up to Adrian. Blame him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I can tell you, I mean, for a typical code base, it's almost always the same story. People um, use type inference in places where it's completely inappropriate uh, and then are just suffering forever after. Uh, like a classic sort of expression that you should just never write is like val x equals foo bar baz, where all of those are these unknown things for which it needs to infer type. So it's going to go, all right, guys. Get your boots on. Here, we're really going to go. We got our work cut out for us today. We need to find out what all those things are so we can love this. All right, so let's not jump to any conclusions. Let's just start a bunch of type inference things going off, polymorphism, God knows. Let it all come back, do a little analysis, come up with weird refinement types by intersecting parents and dreaming up crazy stuff. Let's do that every single time they compile. All you had to do was either like, this, because even if it turned out to be this, that's not like it wasn't that obvious to this guy. Um, or, you know, this, right? Anything. But uh, yeah, the, even, even without the int there, you're in, in reasonably good shape. Um, just because of like the nature of this ends up calling the apply method with you know three things of the same type, but when you when you use colon colon like that, each of those is a separate call with a separately inferred type, which are chaining on each other and then being loved. I, I mean, I saw I, I I changed one line in one project and it was taking like 80 seconds to compile and then it was four, no joke. Because like the guy just lucked into like you know that was a day I was like felt like looking at somebody's random SBT project. Um, he's like it's really slow. Like, yeah, it's really slow. Uh, it's almost always type inference one way or another. The the other big ones that'll get you potentially are like a just a rampant use of implicits. Um, I, I find that most people like are are burned one way or another badly enough before it becomes a giant performance problem um, that they. <laughs> You know, don't paint these terrible situations for themselves. Um, Mix-in composition, if, like, is definitely a problem if you're too nutty about it, like we are in the collections. So, you pay, like, if you got 80 parents spread out all over the place, it's, you know, and a bunch of like, basically, you there's a you linearly with the number of parents that a class has, you pay in a bunch of places. So, you know, you have that many more base types. It's going to work have to work that much harder every time a type is getting inferred or types are getting loved. It's going to be looking through all these base types and like every time you throw in another parent with new type parameters, then it just, you know, those things start doubling up, ending up the O N follows you around. So fewer parents is better um, if you can do it. It's as usual. It's like that's less appealing from an elegant standpoint, and that's you know, it's not. Yeah, it's, you won't hear a lot of stuff like, well, here's how things get better, and it's a more appealing thing to do. Well, of course it's not. That's why you didn't do it in the first place. It seems like for a lot of not so sophisticated, especially beginner Scala programmers, they, they get frustrated. They're like, why is this so slow? And there's there's no automated way to, to really discover that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's like 
60 different obscure command line options you can give to uh, like get out different little windows into the compiler that you can easily understand after a year of constant study. So <laughs> I don't really know what those guys are complaining about. <laughs> Yeah, I did do a typer timings thing that I shipped, shipped all the way to GitHub, you know, my private thing, but a long time ago when uh, somebody wanted it that gives pretty precise timings. But it's very difficult to measure timings in the compiler because of the, because of the way the compiler is architected. But there's a tremendous amount of like latent slowness just hanging there waiting for somebody to roll through some particular code path. They're not necessarily linked at all. So you'll find like if you're measuring things, you know, you were typing some method and like, oh God, that took 20,000 seconds. That's the guy. But that may, may very well not be the guy. It's just that that was the unlucky guy that caused some particular symbols, lazy info to start unrolling at that point. Um, he had nothing to do with it. Anybody might have done it, but he's the guy that did it. Um, and so you have that, you, it doesn't take much of that problem before your timings are like, well, now we know exactly how long each thing takes and the plus or minus one billion because, you know, who knows how much that really was attributed to that. So it's, you, you must have a sort of more uh, sophisticated uh, model for like how your laziness unrolls than we do um, in order to accurately measure things. And I, I don't know if anybody's got a plan for that one other than like don't, don't use that compiler, but uh, I don't. So somebody had a, I saw like a hand going somewhere this direction. No? Fade. Oh. Yeah, wait, I'm sorry. I, I, that was the. I, let me just let that go. I'll come back to you. Uh, I, who was just starting to speak there just a moment ago? I Say. Well, yeah. So uh, it it does. There's a big old map of computed lubs. It, it tries a, a bunch of different things to um, ease the pain, and. Uh, I don't know. From what I like, from my occasional attempts to try things like throwing out all the caches, like it's, it's a coin flip whether it does any good at all. Caching stuff is unfortunately like in vi just very difficult to win on uh, in the compiler. I've tried a million things. Uh, it's is quite often just better to recompute it. So uh, the 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 improvements to be had here are algorithmic much more than they are like memoization based. I'm sorry. I just, uh, I, I was just wondering if you remember the relation and the idea, like Edna was saying, like, you know, basically that gives you a better idea because you already know how long you do for everything else. You have one more line, and you do, like, and then it's lines turn to be slow. Very deceptive, though, right? I mean, what you're really measuring at this point is more likely a hotspot and whether you've been jitted than anything to do with the compiler itself, right? It's like it is very difficult to separate these things. Uh, but I, you, you, you cannot assume much from like I made change X and I saw thing Y. You must have like more controlled circumstances. So yeah, I mean it's possible, but don't count on it. I don't know. It's it's just really hard to measure stuff, and more than that, it's really time consuming. Just tremendously time consuming to try to squeeze accurate numbers out, and it's just like, and then you know things change, and who, your numbers are invalid, right? So it's. Just, We're right. moving towards unit testing. Well, we need to move down. We're trying to, like, you just, you, you think, like, well, we'll just measure the whole thing, compiling a thing. It, it, it's just, you, there's no way to get info out of that. We, and because it's, like, not modular, uh, it's getting there, right? But it's still a great distance to go. It's very difficult to actually, like, say, like, let's test the performance of this bit of it. But that's, that's one reason it's so important to achieve modularity. Yeah, so we have a floor question. For correctness and for performance. But yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, I, I think there, before we get there, we can do some interesting things just like on your code and be like, maybe this is it, or you know, maybe that's it. Right. Well, no guarantees. The, the typer timings thing was designed to say, like, I just had to spend a lot of time typing a particular tree. Like, basically, would, you would give a threshold for number of milliseconds spent typing some particular tree. And if it was over that, it would give you a warning. Hey, man, I just spent a long time on this one. Maybe you should think about annotating a type. And so it would be a low confidence sort of thing, but it would be a place to look, which is better than most people have right now. 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, these are all pretty sad answers. I wish I could say like, well, it's slow because I, you know, I missed something on line 72. It's fixed in trunk. <laughs> no. Uh, which part of it? <laughs> because that was mandated. <laughs> these, these are these are in the realm of um, of assumed constraints uh, outside the realm of discussion. Not uh, I, because I don't know. No, no, no. It's mandated by the powers that be. Okay. Um, it, one could say we don't have separate compilation anymore. We have got to do you know see whatever it is, see whatever sort of, and. I mean, it's it's discussed, freaking it's tempting to me, but it's, you know. Definitely thinking about an optimizer that would just look for your Right. So it, it, it only will work if you guarantee that you will. A more likely scenario is not to abandon the requirement, but to have a, an opt in thing that's like uh, assume whole world analysis available and uh, then let it go. But the problem is that you still, you know, now you can't interoperate with the other kind of bytecode. Um, right. So it's. Wait, well, the, you, did you see in my talk about all the little crazy methods going on in there, right? I mean, so anything that's built with like expecting to find b dollar dollar m underscore setter underscore da 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 is not going to work with anything that's not built to expect that. So either you need to provide those things anyway for compatibility with that, or you've just carved off a separate universe for yourself. Now maybe you can do that. Methods like accessors and stuff, so on and so on, that aren't strictly necessary in the current code base, but might be if you're linking against it. And so if it's not there, it's not there. Uh, so right. So yeah, now we're back at bytecode rewriting, magic stuff. Maybe like you know, maybe that's the answer. Uh, but there's, you know, there's no simple answer, unfortunately. It, with, it doesn't involve punting on that completely. But I think we should punt on it completely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can consider this as like a, a more general problem. On, like, just give me a bunch of class files, and it's not really related. To you can imagine just doing this analysis at the bike goal level, just kind of like ProGuard, where it's focused on getting shedding class files that you don't need or shedding bike that you don't need. You can right. write an optimizer to just optimize it. So right, right, right. All right. Post, post process it all at the end point, yeah. I mean, sure, that's available to do now. Right. It's just, but you're, you really are, it's, this needs to be your application, right? Like, right. we're shipping this right. bundle of bike code that we've made it work with each other, right. but that's as far as it goes. Yeah, but I'm saying I don't think there's anything really scholars. I mean, like, there's, there's, well, there's, there's things you could do differently, but. So, but, so, not really, but there is in the sense that uh, the more sort of mechanisms you provide within your language to uh, partition things, then the more pain you're going to suffer at the level of the JVM if your uh, partitioning requires it to like also mimic those partitions. Um, so, in you know, in this example, like I want to divide my class into 50 traits and put them all in different files. Well, that's, you know, it doesn't stop there. Now the JVM has to have 50 things that are all able to communicate with each other, and it has no channel for that except these ridiculous things that we do. So that, that is a Scala-specific problem in the sense that you, one does not have to have those capabilities in the language, um, or one could implement them somewhat differently. I don't know. But if you declared like, those traits sealed, would that then? Nothing, nothing helps you here. There's no, there's no, nothing will be the least bit helpful. Um, remember that the example I gave had private this val m. Like the, the, it was literally that's as sealed as it gets. Nothing, nothing should be able to see that except m itself. But, but a separate unit could. No, nothing could. See, but nothing should be able to see that at all. The reason that it is even visible anywhere is so that the value can be populated in the instance of x, which nothing can see. Um, but the, uh, the, the requirement that the trait is one set of bytecode and the class is another set of bytecode leads to that necessity because the trait has no state itself, but it has the code necessary to populate the state. <laughs> I, I never pay attention to clocks, so I'll just stand here until you guys tell me to stop. Well, technically, we are at the end, so. But I'll still stand here until you tell me to stop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the, I won't be offended if you want to leave, but if you want to ask more stuff or anybody does. Do you like live questions? Yeah? So you, 
announced, right? They're moving on. Any uh -huh. idea where, like... Uh, I'm not going to work for anybody else. I'm just going to go and sit down and write code. In Scala? Uh, certainly initially. Whether, uh, whether that remains the case uh, remains to be seen. Uh, but yeah, uh, I got an awful lot of mind share invested in Scala, so that doesn't change very fast. It's uh, quite an interesting game. I'd like to write an AI for it. <laughs> um, so have I tried it? Well, let's just say that I've seen enough. Like the, They did one thing that I admire so much that I love them for that. But it's like beyond that, it looks like a language from the 70s to me, like with a slightly less maybe early 80s. Right? I mean, I, you know, I, Maybe maybe they just have like see through time better than me, but I feel like we've learned some stuff in 30 years. You don't just ignore all that stuff. That's my general feeling about Go. Uh, but you only asked if I tried it, so the answer is no. <laughs> but the one thing that they did that I wanted to point out that I think is so wonderful and is such a stark contrast to my own last five years is that they have two compilers. They like so that you know it's like these things have to be in agreement, like, and if they're not, one of them is broken, right? So it's like this is this is a team that's serious about like there being a specification and that it is, and that the implementation matches the specification. That's like that's what you do if that's really what you want, and that you get somewhere doing that, right? And like my you know my number one frustration by far has been the, the essentially abandonment of the specification of Scala, uh, and so like wow two wow two compilers <laughs> that's great, but that's not enough to carry it. Two hmm? What does that mean? Well, it, it means that they have two, impl two implementations of the language. It means, that, uh, it means that one does, because if you have one implementation of the language, that defines the spec. It doesn't matter what spec says. The, uh, the implementation is the spec. That's how life is. Scala compiler, as impossible as it is to like, deduce what it's going to do, that's the spec, not the, not the written spec. That's life. But if you have two, now you got something, right? Now you don't have an implementation that's the spec. You have two things that need to agree. What they agree on, that's the spec. Now that's a much more powerful thing, a much more believable thing than one implementation, no matter how much like, you may believe it to be specified. Why not three? Why not three? That would be great. His resources are limited. Uh, but absolutely, more, more is better, 100%. But two is the first I ever heard of somebody starting with two. Like, it's, they, got, it, they get a lot of engineering, right? They also have a really cool tool called Go Fix It yeah. that they use for language evolution. So right. whenever they make a breaking change, they have Oh, can you imagine? Can you imagine if we could just ship new versions and like just like the scaffolding to make the old version continue to work as comes with it? Oh my God, we'd be out of jobs. We wouldn't have anything to do. What do you think of the built-in formatting as well? Yeah, I, I guess I'm less like I. I like the idea of, uh, of there only being one way to format code, but from what I've seen, nobody else has enough taste for me to even allow them to begin to tell me how I need to format my code. If I, it's again, like if I'm the dictator, if I can pick the formatting, then I think that's a great idea. Uh, but there's a, like, I'm very sensitive to the aesthetics of code, exactly how it looks. I think it's very, very important for like the comprehensibility of it. And in my experience, most people are like uh, the are Philistines. Yeah. that you'd be fine in a year. Uh, well, again, as long as I was choosing. Or let's no, say. Uh, everybody else was choosing. If it was consistent yeah. and you couldn't have a choice, you'd be fine. Well, you'd, you'd need, well you might need a gun to keep me programming. Yeah. Well, or <laughs> my, editor, my editor can reformat it. It's just that like, from what I've seen, anybody else's set of choices is just not going to do it for me. But you're right. I mean, it's, I, I, I do think like, far too much time is spent on like, twiddling with formatting. But I would rather solve it with like, you know, Scalar form on the way into the repository, always consistentizing stuff, than I would any kind of like, mandated language thing. I mean, I, I think this is a solvable problem with remotely decent tooling. And the fact that it's not really well solved in general, it just means that people don't care that much. Yeah, right, but it isn't though, right? I mean, like in many cases, choice is not great. Like right. you think it is, but it's in fact it's worse than no choice. Like, but if we all grew up with a single format, we wouldn't know it, 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 a choice existed. Probably fine with it. Well, I think a lot of like horrifying atrocities have been uh, justified on similar yeah. grounds, right? Yeah. I, <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, really, it's like it's you know you could say like, well, if nobody knew about there being alternatives, right? I mean, yeah, it's it's tough. Uh, let's just say it's not an easy one. Um, which language? Uh, in the Go language. Oh, I don't know, really. I, I literally, what I know about the Go language is that I assessed the feature list and thought it beneath uh, my interest. Because um, my time is pretty limited and a lot of languages come by. And I could just, like, I, for, I forget what the particular things that they punted on were. Maybe it was, like, no exceptions or something. Um, like, check all your return values. Polymorphism. No, polymorph. Yeah, no polymorphism. Forget it. I'm not interested. I mean, that, that's, that's ludicrous. That's crazy. Uh, you like uh, without generics, and you know the implementation of generics in both Java and Scala is like loaded with pain. But the idea of programming without generics I, is not on the radar for me at all. No way. Um, so. Uh, you can Stockholm syndrome or something. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm loaded with pain. I'm not doing it without. <laughs> I, 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 no, I don't. I, I, I'm saying that generics are spectacular, and I am that uh, because the implementation is like you know, especially from Java, but I mean, because of the many constraints imposed by like JVM and et cetera, it means it's not the like completely satisfying programming experience that ought to be, like say it is in Haskell, uh, but uh, even just, yeah, despite that, I would never give it up. Uh, even under these conditions, whereas I, you know, I can imagine much better conditions. But if I'm going to move away from the JVM, the last thing I want to do is move towards something that you know looks in every way to me to be worse. Yeah. That's again. It's like those guys. I'm sure that they're doing useful stuff. If like your target is systems programming and your mind is, you know, basically thinks Unix is like the pinnacle of design, but that I don't share those feelings. And so, that's yeah. Do you have any Uh I guess you know about power mode. <laughs> Got to know power mode. Uh, there's, there is some hidden stuff, I think. <laughs> well, I guess hold out for a little while, because I guess one of the first things I'm going to end up doing is writing the REPL I always wanted uh, from outside of the thing. Uh, that's because I've already done that a bunch of times, and I've just like never quite gotten, you know, shipped it. But I've done so much REPL work, it's sick. So if I can just pull it together, anyway. I, so hold out for that, and I'll try to make that a reality because I would really like it, because it's very frustrating to me that it's still really terrible compared to what I know is possible. Uh, and I've just never, like, a as time has gone on, I've had less and less time that I can really reasonably allocate to it. Oh, God, yes. So I was just playing with that the other day with SBT as well, right? Like, I really want these things so... Uh, I, I got Nailgun doing that for me so that I could just like connect to an SBT thing and have it all hot. But Nailgun and JLine don't seem to behave with each other. If I can, if I can solve that, then, uh, then this is the way to go, I think. You ought to be able to just like, you know, connect to a previous existing uh, session. Just, it should be instantaneous. And it was. It's like, I, this works in principle, but you can't give up like JLine stuff. Um, but on the other hand, I have a half done-ish complete rewrite of J-Line in Scala, if, sitting around from like three years ago, the last time I went down this route. Sline, of course. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so this had some great stuff, right? Do you know what the magic space is in Bash? So like if you say bang, bang, space, then like within your command line, it expands to the previous thing. So I had that going in the REPL. So you had the whole history with magic space so that you could go do, 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 bang, and like whoop, and it expands. That is awesome. Um, but you know, JLine, yeah, JLine is like the source of most of the struggle. It's getting the formatting right. And it's like the tiniest thing wrong with, you know, being off by like one character means that you think you're on the left, you're over on the right, and it's completely maddening. And the, I never had the patience to work out those little details of like, J random terminal, and especially Windows, gigantic, like, kill, Windows held so much back in the REPL you don't even know, because it's like, it doesn't work on Windows, and after a day of, in like a VM, sitting there banging my head, it's like, all right, I just saw it, just live without it. But that's not a problem anymore, because I can just go write whatever I want, and it doesn't have to work on Windows. Um, I heard Perl 5, but I didn't hear what the question that went with Perl 5 was. Speaking of languages that have the definition as exactly what the compiler. Oh, yeah. Well, 
I, I, it's, more forgivable, it's more forgivable in Perl to some extent just because we knew less then, right? I mean, like a lot, a lot of things I will, I will give a lot of latitude to the guys of the past. Uh, not only did we know less, but it was, like, it was less important as well. Uh, we know now, though, you know, what's it, like what matters in terms of you know, how a thing makes its mark on the world. And I think it's irresponsible not to take things like you know, the specification of things so that other people can work with it without wanting to kill themselves. Uh, those things take seriously. So I don't know. Perl mostly, like, I think, is an, although I would never choose to use it at this point, as I, I, have, I have warm feelings about its overall existence. Um, and Rust is, uh, is that Brendan's uh, language at Mozilla? Is that the one? Yeah, that's one. So Rust has some interesting stuff going on for sure. But then like, then I was reading like, the, they're another one of these guys that say like, well, <laughs> you're not supposed to co have covariant uh, refinement of your parameters. It's unsound, but it's what people want. <laughs> I, guess, I guess that wasn't their exact words, but it was something along the lines of like, well, we have these optional types, but they're really optional, right? It's like, we're, you know, we're not even particularly concerned with whether they're accurate. Uh, they're doing some interesting stuff, but not interesting enough. Like, I, I, I'm con fully convinced to the core of my being that the answer to our problems, maybe, maybe this is one of those like types are like XML or sex. If it's not solving your problem, you're not, you know, you're not doing enough of it. Uh, I, but, I, but I really think that that's like, if types aren't solving your problem, it's because you don't have enough of them or because they're not sophisticated enough. Um, and like, any language that's moving away from more powerful types is not, is not my thing. So, and in that sense, Scala, for all its issues I have with it, uh, is, is definitely like, you know, at least trying, you know, like to provide a really rich type system. But I think there's a long way to go. What else do you want to work on besides S line? Well, I mean, I just want to write the compiler the way I want to write the compiler, to be honest. I mean, so, I mean, that's probably what I'm going to do is just sit around and like do stuff the way I want to do it. Best case, I can I do that, and it's really useful, and they have, they use it in the real compiler. But we're saving up to buy it back from it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, most likely, it's just me writing code I think looks neat, and uh, nobody else ever cares or sees it, and that's fine with me because I will still be pleased to do that. At this point, that has started to sound real good. <laughs> All right, well, that, that looks, uh, you guys look pretty done. It's late enough. I'm, I gotta hide before anybody tries to get me to buy them dinner for, for my last talk. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your attendance. Sorry if it wasn't the, exactly what was in the uh, brochure.